Hey guys, my name is Rob. I work at CIT Black Rock Castle Observatory and to celebrate Space Week 2018 we're here at the Shin A pub and as a special treat we're about to interview astronaut Dan Tanny. So follow me on inside and we'll have a quick pint and chat. You've seen the world from that beautiful top-down view spinning around underneath you. Uh, was it up there that you realized Cork was the best place in the world or when you came back <laughs> Uh, so my, 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 uh, relationship with Cork goes back to, well, let's see. So, uh, the golf course, the old head opened in 1988 and, um, I heard about it and I actually went to play it in the early, early days. But then we, I came back with, uh, another friend and the weather was awful. Uh, it was so awful that actually they closed the course, which is rare. And so we sat in the clubhouse and, uh, uh, I got to know the staff and uh, the woman that was uh, the original business manager out there at the golf course was this uh, lovely young lady and um, so I kind of got my eye on her and we got married 18 months later so right. I've been uh, and uh, so and I tell people you know if you're gonna get married uh, and if you're gonna have in-laws uh, it was, it's great if they are from a fantastic place because you're gonna have to go visit. So did the space book bite you early or was it something you stumbled into a little later in life? So like when I was uh, young, when I was seven, eight, nine, sort of my early memories, uh, that is exactly when we were uh, landing on the moon for the first time, uh, uh, driving around the moon for the first time, and the whole American society was space crazy. You could buy astronaut lunch cans, you could buy astronaut food, you could buy uh, t tang, you know, the orange drink. It was, everything was astronauty. And so I grew up where I, everybody wanted to be an astronaut. And it was, um, it was the thing, it was the popular culture thing. And so, but like probably everybody else, I never really, I never took it seriously. I never, you know, I. I never endeavored to be a cowboy either, right? But everybody wanted to be a cowboy. And so, um, so yes, of course I wanted to be an astronaut since I can remember, but I never really seriously wanted to be an astronaut. I never thought that's the path I want to take. That's, that's what I want to do for, for a career. And, um, and so, you know, the whole astronaut thing was filed at the back of my head. Um, but I did... I, I was always fascinated with the machines of space, rockets and satellites and stuff like that. And I was also fascinated with the exploration idea of going someplace that, that, that people hadn't been before. And I think those are the things, those are the seeds that started growing in the back of my head. And when I became an engineer, it turns out, I would say coincidentally, I, worked, I ended up in the space industry and started working on, on uh, satellites and, and, and rockets. And then I met a few engineers, uh, excuse me, I met a few astronauts doing that job. And when you meet somebody that has, you know, you know, I'm like, wow, he's an astronaut. Look, he, 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 uh, he, he eats just like a regular person, right? He, you know, you can, then all of a sudden you can identify with him. That Then something like that becomes real. Like, oh, wow, he's, you know, he has a job. He has a, a really cool job. And, uh, and then uh, it doesn't take much to, to make the connection. Like, well, I, I could, you know, I could do that job, and, or I'd like to try doing that job. And so it wasn't until I was about thirty when I really thought that's something that I should really think about. Um, uh, you know, at, and when I was thirty, I looked back on my life and I said, well, I went to a pretty good college. My grades are pretty good. I've done some interesting things. My eyes are good, which is a, one of the hard things to one of the things you can't really change. My eyesight was good, and um, I felt like I was in pretty good health. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to send an application in and uh, along with thousands of other people. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, maybe I'll be top 25% or something. You know, maybe they'll talk to me or something. But, uh, but I never, never seriously thought that I would be, you know, one of the few selected. But, uh, but that's what happened. And I got very, very fortunate. So you got your, uh, your master's in mechanical engineering right. at MIT. But you focused on uh, group decision making, was it? Yeah. So, so is that more psychology or? Yeah. So I right. I I got my um, I went I, I did a, my bachelor degree in mechanical engineering. Then I went back to 
uh, studied mechanical engineering for my master's degree. And I was always, I still am fascinated with how people make decisions. And so um, there's a little corner of mechanical engineering that was called human factors. And in the old days, in the 50s, this used to be how do you design a knob that clearly you know, indicates what you're pointing at? And how do you design a dial that, like, are you, like the gas thing on your car, right? The petrol, show how much petrol you've got. And how do you, you know, what fonts do you use? What colors do you use? How do you convey information with the displays? That's how it started. That, that, so that's why, that's why it was in mechanical engineering. It was, that's, that's why it was in the corner. But then, in the 70s and 80s, it became, how do you design a computer screen that conveys the information to the user, right? And then it became this interface. How do you, how do you get machines to interface with the humans that, that have to use them? And then, and then a little bit later in the 80s and 90s, it was, well, now it's not just a computer that I'm interfacing with, but there's people on the other ends of the computer. Now that we network computers together, now I, I the human, have to deal with the machine that is dealing with humans. So in the, from that little corner of how do you design a dial and how do you paint the numbers in yellow or red, came this corner of human factors, which is how do groups of people surround uh, across the world or, or across a room or wherever, how do you best make a decision? If that decision is uh, uh, selling a stock uh, or, 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 or uh, deploying a nuclear weapon, right? Because if you're going to have a, uh, a, a any, if you're going to have any kind of military action, there are different people that have to agree. Yes, you can fire on that, or y yes, we're going to activate the satellite, or whatever. And that's a command and control decision, and that will involve more than one person. We're sure, we hope, we think. And if you're going to involve more than one person, then you're going to have to decide how how you make decisions. So that's so. Let's see. That's a long, very long answer uh, to your question about my my <clears throat> fascination or, or what I did with my my master's degree, which is how do groups of people make decisions. So it turns out I I actually got to use that later on in my career. So I did that, and I thought I was going to spend the rest of my career in uh, think tanks doing. Exper basically experimental psychology, that kind of thing, which is the, the experimental side of this whole thing. I actually got recruited back into the aerospace program, uh, aerospace industry with a, co uh, with a small company there. And in that job, I turned out, it turned out that my, um, my job became putting a control room together to launch rockets. So you've seen all the people in front of the computers and um, What's really interesting about that, when you, if you launch a rocket, you have dozens and dozens of people, yet the only output that that whole group of people has is yes, press the button, or no, don't press the button. And it's hours and hours, and you do multiple things, you check this, you check that, you, you know. However, your job as a team is press the button, don't press the button. And that tied right back into my, into my group decision uh, research and, and not that I was an expert, but I have a fascination in it. So it fed right back into my fascination with how do people, how do people make decisions. And so, um, so let me back up to your question. Your question was, uh, or your, 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 you wanted to talk about my master's degree. Yes, it was mechanical engineering, but nowadays that stuff lives in either uh, experimental psychology or economics now. Economics now has taken that field of how do people, how do groups of people make decisions? How do you incentivize people to make a particular decision or not a different type of decision? And so, uh, uh, so now I follow, now I like to follow the field of economics because it, it, it has picked up that uh, field of how do, how do groups of people make decisions and how can you affect those decisions? So, I mean, that's a very obvious uh, example of how you used that here on the ground in your career. Did that background help you on the ISS in any way? Um, I would say uh, I, can't, I, I can't really draw a line between what I studied, any of my studies, and 
and flying on the ISS. Uh, flying on the ISS is a different skill set. Um, you need to, since you have to get to the ISS, you have to be a member of a vehicle that's launching into space. And so to do that, you've got to learn all about the vehicle and the safety of that and all the things that can go wrong. And so the shuttle or the Soyuz, it's, it's a complicated procedure. And since you're going to be, since it's a small group that flies it, you have to you have responsibility. So you have to understand how all that works. And then same thing about coming home. But once you're there in the ISS, um, your job, the job is really, uh, you're either going to, like when I was there, I was, uh, we were there during assembly, so I, was, I had to put stuff together. I had to understand how to put the big module on and do the spacewalks and all that stuff. So that was, uh, that was the skill set that, that, the primary skill set I needed. And that was just basic engineering, so being an engineer helped that. I can understand that. I understand that you have to bolt this together first and then you plug this in or whatever, I, that I got. The, the more subtle skill that we need now to fly in the space station and, and to go back to the moon and to asteroids is the, uh, the group dynamics, the understanding how you fit into a team, uh, the ability to resolve conflict with other people that you, that you live with for, in a very tight quarter for a long amount of time. Um, the, uh, uh, the ability to make sure that, that you don't get self-centered and you think, hey, we're sitting here on the space station and um, it's really annoying because the ground keeps telling us to do this and we don't want to do this, we want to do that. Understanding that you're part of the team, you're only a part of the team and a big part of the team is on the ground and so when they talk to you, you have to appreciate their role in the team and not think that you're any better than they are and so when they tell you to do something you think is completely stupid you trust that they have a real reason to do that so you, you do that so the psychological aspect of of being a team member and working in a close team um, now drives how we select astronauts because we can it's easy to get good engineers uh, or good um, uh, like doctors that can, that can do procedures or that can react in, in high stressful situations. It's relatively easy to find those or it's easy to identify those. Sure. The thing that's harder to identify is somebody that can be a really good team member that, that gets along with other people, that uh, uh, resolves conflict well, those kind of things. Because right now we're six people on the space station for six months at a time. That's pretty stressful. But, you know, pretty soon... Uh, I hope we're going to be 12 people that are in a smaller spacecraft going to Mars. And we're going to have to figure out, how, for, and that's the 10 months to get there, and two years there, and 10 months back. You know, that's a lot of time together. So what's, what's that right mix of people? Who, how, do we, how do we pick those people to do those kinds of, of things without killing each other or hating each other? Or, you know, so uh, um, that's, the, that's the more interesting aspect of being a space station astronaut that, that uh, doesn't get overlooked, but, but it's as important as finding somebody that can bolt, bolt this thing together or reprogram the computer or whatever. So it was in 1996 you were selected for the astronaut candidate? Right. So Do you remember getting that, that phone call or that letter? Yeah. So, um, right. so I applied, I sent my application in in 1992, and they, they select astronauts every other year generally. And so there was going to be a selection in, uh, in I gotta get, remember if I get all my dates right, but there was going to be a selection in 92, but then they delayed it to 93, and then, um, and then they did a selection in 95. And so when I sent my application in 92, uh, I say it was like, it's like buying a lottery ticket and putting it in your back pocket. Fr quite frankly, since the process is so long, quite frankly, you forget, or I forgot, that I was even part of this thing. So when they did that first selection in 93, I think, I just remember getting a postcard in the mail that said, you know, thank you very much, but no thank you, which is exactly what I expected to get. And so I filed that away. And then when they did the next selection, they just send you a blank application. They say, please fill in any new information since, since your last application. And uh, I didn't have much, so I just signed the bottom of a blank application and send it in. And again, uh, really, 
it was not on my for, on the forefront of my head that um, that another selection was taking place because I really thought I had virtually zero percent chance of getting in. It was just fun to play. You know, it's just fun to be in the in the pool. And so uh, uh, they asked me to go get a physical, uh, which I now know if they ask you to get a physical, you're probably in the top. 300 of the thousands, okay? Because they're, they're, the, they pay for a physical, they're not going to pay for everybody to get a physical. So they asked me to get a physical, and I knew that was good news, but I didn't realize how how, how selective that was. And then um, the day I was supposed to get my physical, and it was going to be later than they wanted it, so the day, you know, because I was supposed to submit it within, I don't know, whatever the day was, and it was, it was going to be a week late. And so uh, the phone rang, and, and uh, was Teresa from NASA. Teresa is the, was the secretary for the admissions uh, selection office. And I, I immediately said, oh, I'm, I'm getting my physical today. I promise, you know, it's going to get in the mail. You'll get it next week. And she goes, oh, no, don't worry about that. I just wanted to know if you want to come down and uh, interview for the astronaut position. So I said, you know, of the stupid things that you remember saying in your whole life, I said the stupidest thing that uh, that you could say at that point, which is, um, okay, uh, when when was that? Let me let me check. Let me see what I'm doing that week. <laughs> so, I, oh well, hold on. And then of course, then as soon as I say it, I'm like, oh no, I'm pretty sure I can clear yeah. my calendar <laughs> uh, my for that week, that right? Thing, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, um, uh, so I interviewed uh, the fall of '95, and um, uh, when they interview astronauts, they interview you. They interview, they, it's changed a little bit in the last five years, but uh, the way they did it back then was they would uh, bring 20 of you in, 20 candidates in, and then um, the 20 of you all live in the same hotel. You basically do everything together, except each of us, have, you have 20 different schedules to see. There are, uh, during that, it's a week-long interview. During that week, there are, mm, I would guess, 20 or 25 medical uh, evaluations Everything that they can do uh, on you, over you, in you, uh, they do. So it's it's a, an unbelievably thorough uh, val. And then there's some tours, you know, that you get to go see some stuff. And then there's a one-hour um, panel interview where you're interviewed by the selection panel. Uh, and in my case, it was uh, chaired by John Young, very famous Apollo astronaut, and uh, various other astronauts, and a couple a couple HR people. So so that's the week. <laughs> And it's, uh, you make really good friends, tight friends there, of course, because you're all in it together. And you all are rooting for each other, which is a really good camaraderie kind of thing. And, and now, looking back, I'm sure that that's, they watch that. Who's, get, who is, who's team building and who is, who is you know, resistant to that. And uh, so that was October. And then, um, then the rumor was, well, that they said, OK, we're going to make our announcement in. February, something like that. We were the second group to be interviewed, so they had five more, four more groups to, to go. So end of February. So end of February comes. Now this is 1996, very early internet days, and so we did have an email uh, group. We started an email group, but it wasn't crazy. Now it wasn't. You, you were not on this discussion group like you are now. So every three or four days there'd be an email. Somebody would send an email out. Well, I heard this, I heard that. And so there were three or four false starts. Like, oh, they're going to make an announcement on Friday. They're going to make the announcement on... And so, so pretty soon, just like all the false starts, you just, it starts, you start, you didn't start taking none of them seriously. Now they're going to make calls on Monday. They're going to make calls on... And so, uh, uh, however, uh, whenever it was, April... Somebody got some really, they said they got some firm information. Calls are going to be made Monday morning. So I, uh, Monday morning, I wore a suit. I wore my, I have space, lucky space socks, wore my lucky space socks, <laughs> and uh, got in early to work. And what I knew was, what I had heard was, if the, if the chairman of your selection board, in my case, John Young, if he's calling you, you're in. If the, if the administration guy that runs the selection uh, group, his name is Dwayne. He he's just the he's the administrator, but he runs the group, right? If he calls you, mm, bad news. So I was like, is it going to be John Young? Is it going to be Dwayne Ross? John Young, Dwayne Ross. So the phone rings. 
when I pick it up and uh, I hear, hey, hi, this is Dave Liesma from, from NASA. Neither of those, right? <laughs> so, so now I, I don't know how to feel. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel. David Liesma, uh, it turns out, and I knew this, but he's, uh, he, was the, he, was the ask, he was the boss of all the astronauts. So he was actually a step higher, and they had, our class is very big, 35 people, so they actually needed more help to call all the, to call all the, the people that got selected. So David Leesma got selected. But, so I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> I'm trying to think, what does this mean, what does this mean, what does this mean? And uh, he, he did what the classic, the classic call to be an astronaut. Um, I've heard it many times, and it, it happened to me, and he says, hey, I'm just wondering if you'd like to come down and work for us here in, in Houston. And uh, I said, yes, sir, I'd really like to do that. Uh, that'd be my honor. And uh, so I hung up, and then I realized the word astronaut was never spoken. And then I thought, I wonder if I just accepted a job to be like an engineer down the right. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if maybe this is how they get engineers to move to Houston. Or it's, you know? <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, they followed up later in the day with press release and stuff. So, so, but, but, because, uh, uh, but it was, it is very interesting. It's very. That's that's the beginning of, of this very, the subtlety around being an astronaut. Um, even the job offer, it's never said. Would you like to be an astronaut? It's. Do you want to come down and work for us here at NASA? And uh, it sets a tone that is still there today. Where, I think. I think we astronauts, it's been my experience that we astronauts are uh, almost a little embarrassed about being an astronaut. It's, it's, uh, it's such a privilege. And I know very few astronauts, I know a few, but very, very few astronauts where when you're talking to them, it comes out in the first couple minutes. And uh, I think we, we prefer to be, we, we prefer to be, uh, we like to, I, I agree with the saying that my, some of my colleagues have, which is we're, we're very happy that the job is the celebrity and we, the individuals, are not. So the, uh, we think that the, the, this is the celebrity and, and, and as, opposed to, as opposed to any individual ones of us. And, uh, and I, think that, I think the way the job offer came to us sets that tone, which is, uh, you know, we don't, like to, we don't like to talk about it too much. We're very fortunate to have this job, but... Uh, I think most of us like to uh, not, not make a big deal. Sitting in a bar with a guy and you start a conversation with a stranger and he's like, oh, you know, I'm a doctor or whatever. And then he's like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an astronaut. And he's like, get out of town. I mean, does that happen? Yeah, of course, right? Um, again, I can only speak for myself, and I, but I think I represent the majority of the astronauts that I've interacted with, which is... Um, I mean, I feel like even talking about this is, is like being a little bit uh, bragging about it. But um, I never tell anybody I'm an astronaut. I, 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 I will, I will make sure they're really interested. Like some of you have this conversation. Hey, what do you do? And like, it's all of a sudden the conversation will dramatically change if I say, "Well, I'm an astronaut," and so. Generally, I'll say, well, you know, I work for NASA, or, you know. And then if they're really interested, and they keep, yeah, what do you do, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine talking about them. But I, I want to make sure that, that that's where the conversation really is going, that they're really interested in, 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 in what I'm doing. And uh, so with, 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 with the minor exception, um, I, we, we even call it the A word. So I'll keep the A word in my back pocket for a while. Um, it's just to make sure that that's where the conversation really wants to go, and yeah. and uh, and you know if somebody's really into it, that's great. I'm I, I'm really happy to talk about them if they're really interested. But I think most of us don't want to, oh oh you know step on the brain surgeon, you know or whatever that you know. Who, that's not that's not what we want to do. We don't we're not trying to overplay you know somebody else's. Sure. I mean, I had a really childish question I wanted to ask. I know you guys abbreviate astronaut candidates. Ask hands. You're right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But right. I mean, I thought, you know, maybe somebody should have run that by someone. And, you know, it, it sounds really funny. But I mean, do you think that's part of, you know, that resistance to call, 
yourself an astronaut? Is that part of the reason they do that? No, so yeah, so astronaut candidates, that's the first year you've been selected in the astronaut corps. You go through a year and a half of, we call it basic training, or you know, learning how to be an astronaut. And at that point, after, after you've completed that, then you get your silver wings. That means you, you're an official member of the astronaut corps. And until then, you're called an astronaut candidate, even though very, very rarely will somebody not get through astronaut candidate training. And so we call them ask hands. No, and I think that has much more to do with uh, uh, standard group dynamics. It's why well, it's why freshmen at the Naval Academy are called plebes. It's why you know every I would th I would imagine that there are other school or social or work environments where the new the new guys have a uh, a bit of a disadvantage. They need to sort of, or there's a bit of joking that they're the new guys, and uh, so I think it has much more to do with that. And sure. so, but ask hands is a is a is a. I mean. Trust me, they're all happy to be asked hands. <laughs> so. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, in two, two oh, you know what? We so just more inside baseball here. So the the once you've been accepted by NASA, you're an ask hand. It's the next step down. The people that are ir interviewing or the people that are trying to get an interview, those are astronaut hopefuls, assholes. <laughs> so just so you know, okay? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so 2001 is when you finally uh, you head up on the, the endeavor, right? But ahead of that, I mean, how how are you feeling? You know, nerves. Like, are there pre-flight rituals that you have to undertake, or well, you know, so going through your head at that. Point? <clears throat> so I'll back you up a little bit. So I'm selected in '96, and I go through two years of ask hand training. So now we're at '98, uh, uh, and. Uh, and then we're eligible for flight assignment, and there's 35 in my class. And then, uh, so there's some superstars in my class. And so they get flight assignments, and you think, that well-deserved. Those guys should be flying soon. And then, um, and then, you know, flight assignments come out every couple months, and then, uh, boom, there's another crew assigned. And then, you know, all the superstars have been assigned, and now, you're, now, now, the, now it's starting to look like a pecking order, right? And so, okay, well, there's uh, some, oh yeah, that guy, you're right, that, or that woman, that she is really strong, I can completely see why they pick her. But now you're starting to, now you're looking, you know, you're looking at the, the rest of your class and you're, you're, you're wondering where you rank in there, right? You're, when am I going to get picked? And there was a, uh, there was a moment where, um, this is a, this is a funny story inside the astronaut office that involves me, but, uh, uh, I was at the gym one night, and I was the only one in the gym. And it was right after the 2000 election in America. And if you don't remember, the 2000 uh, election uh, was not resolved on election night because there are so many close races, and they recounted and recounted. And so the results of the election weren't res resolved for weeks. Had to go to the Supreme Court. It was, it was a mess. So, uh, so I'm in the gym. Uh, working out, the TV's on, and in walks uh, my boss's boss's boss. He he's the he his his uh, he he runs the he's the boss of the astronaut office and some other stuff. But he's the big boss, and flight assignments go through him. So I know that flight assignments, all the flight assignments have to go through him. And so um, he's a former astronaut, and. Uh, so we're doing that thing you do in the gym where you're just not working out, but you're standing and making awkward conversations. So we're just sort of trying to make awkward conversation and, and uh, uh, not say anything stupid to the guy who makes flight assignments. And so we're kind of you know, doing that thing where you're kind of watching the TV and trying to figure out what to say. And so it's all about the election, of course. And he says, he turns to me and he goes, so um, do you folks uh, in Japan have the same problems with elections that we do here in America? Right, because there are Japanese astronauts. I'm not one of them. <laughs> right. So at that moment, I realized he has no idea who I am. Right. He he has no idea who I am, and I'm thinking I'm never going to fly. I, I, you know, I am invisible on his list of who's who should we pick for the next for the next flights. And so uh, 
the good part of that story is it's a gr it's a hilarious story for us astronauts that that uh, that that that, uh, that my boss's boss had no idea who I was. <laughs> but I would say so. Fortunately, though, no, I got I got uh, I got the call um, uh, right at the beginning of two thousand one, and uh, trained for all of two thousand one, and we flew at the end of two thousand one. So that was Space Shuttle Endeavor SGS one hundred and eight, and it was a it was a uh, twelve day mission to the space station, and uh, we were a crew exchange. We brought three people up to the space station, and we brought three people down from the, sp the space station. Um, the big Plus for me is that uh, we it, that mission required a spacewalk, and so then I got chosen to do uh, the spacewalk on that mission. And um, you're not the deep end, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's you know if you could design a perfect first flight, uh, it was it. The the commander, the guy who ran the mission, uh, a fantastic guy, really a role, role model in my life, and uh, so really appreciated flying with him. Um, my, my pilot was Mark Kelly, who was my classmate. Uh, his claim to fame now is his wife, Gabby Giffords, the one that was shot. And now they, they, uh, they run a, 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 a big nonprofit. But he's, so he's, he, he, he had a fantastic astronaut career. And, uh, and then my other, the other mission specialist is a woman named Linda Godwin, senior astronaut. And she was my, my spacewalk lead, so I learned a lot about spacewalking from her. So it was a great mission. So. Uh, your, your question was a, sort of the build up to that mission. Um, you know, I, from 96 until 2001, that's five years where, you know, almost every day I think about what it's going to be like to fly and what I'm, you know, how I'll do and, and uh, what I'll be asked to do. And uh, like many things, you know, once you're in it and once you're step by step, you, you, you kind of lose the big picture of holy cow, I'm going to be put in a space suit and I'm going to go out in the vacuum of space. Uh, it, it you, you sort of lose that overall view, and you, you, you focus on the you know with the procedure, the you know, and uh, and there were there were just a few moments during that whole process where where I, I stepped back and I appreciated the fortune I got you know the fortune that got me there, and then the magnitude of what's going to happen later. It's a, one of the things that a commander has to do is uh, meet with their crew a couple months before launch. And say, guys, make sure your wills are up to date. You know, like, you know, we know this is dangerous. So I can't. It's, you know, one of our jobs, one of my jobs as commander, is to make sure that your your lives are in order. So that if the worst happens, that at least it's not miserable for those of you in the ground. That was one of those moments where you go, wow, that's you know. But I'll be honest with you, every one of you should be doing the same thing, right? <laughs> you don't know when the car is going to come out of nowhere. You don't know, and so. Uh, uh, you know, so guys, make sure that your wills are up to date, that your affairs are, are settled, because you never know what's going to happen. But, of course, for a launch, right, of course, that's one of these big things. So that was one of those moments where I was like, wow, this is, uh, this is a significant thing I'm doing. So, so uh, I saw an interview with Chris Hadfield where he's talking about the Russians and how uh, they... They have this pre-flight ritual where before they get into the launching vehicle, they get out and they pee on the back right-hand yeah. tire of the bus. The bus, the bus that takes them out. Sure. There. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something similar on the American side? So, uh, yeah, did everybody hear that? Does everybody know that the tradition, the pee on the tire tradition? So, yeah, yes. Is there, a, is there a similar tradition? We have traditions on the shuttle. Um, none of them involve urine. Um, <laughs> Oh, actually, no. I apologize. One of them does. It. One of them does involve urine. Um, let me t let me cover that one first, and then so uh, you get in your suit and you're zipped up into your suit, and then um, you get out into the van. Uh, well, first of all, you everybody gets checked out. You go in the van, take the van out to the launch tower, go up the launch tower, and um, you start getting strapped in. And then you're in the shuttle for three hours even before you launch. And then you're going to be in the thing for another hour and a half, an orbit or two before you get out of the suit. So you're going to be in that suit for a while. So there's a toilet on the right, right around the corner from where you walk, where you walk out onto the, um, to the board the shuttle. And so that, it, I mean, it's a toilet, it's not a tire, but it's a toilet. <laughs> but it is the last, it's the last rest stop before space. And so everybody... Uh, gets an opportunity there, but you know these suits are not made for uh, 
quick access to go to the bathroom. Sure. Um, so that's it's, it's a whole procedure. Um, other rituals we have, uh, we have, uh, it's just, I was just out there. We have a, it's called the Beach House, and it was used by the Apollo guys, and it's, a, it's on uh, the Kennedy Space Center land, and it's right on the beach, it's a little house, and um, we meet, uh, we, as the crew that's going to launch, has a, have a few ep- evenings out there before launch, and one evening we invite Every crew member gets to invite four family or four people uh, to come, and we have a meal, and we get to know each other, and get to finally get to meet parents and stuff like that. And uh, uh, but then uh, and then we we have a bottle of wine or something, you know, and then we all sign the bottle. So in that beach house, there's I assume 135 you know missions worth of wine bottles that are out there, and and, and so that's that's sort of one of these traditions that we that we do, um, nothing else is really that, you know, that I think, oh, yeah, uh, you, so you just have to do it. That's, that's, that's what you have to do before you go to space, but the, the Russians have the best one. <laughs> <laughs> so you get into the ISS, I mean, what, what's the first, you know, excited, you're like, I'm in space, now I have to do this thing. Is it the flight? Is it the view of Earth? I mean, where did yeah. you find yourself being drawn to? <laughs> so, uh, when you launch on the shuttle, you spend two days before you get to the space station, and uh, the first hours after you get into orbit, it only takes eight and a half minutes to get into orbit, and then the first hours, couple hours, are really busy. You have to convert this rocket ship into a spaceship, and uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of things you. Anyway, there's lots of procedures, and so. And you practice, you practice that first couple hours many times. And so you launch, you engine shut off, and then you have this pre, well-rehearsed procedure. You unstrap, you take off your helmet, you put it over here, you take gloves off, put it over here, you go this, you know. So, so for the first couple hours, you're doing with a thing that you've practiced many times. Procedure, you check these switches, you turn this off, you stow this, you know, right? And so, really, being in space for the first time felt just like the simulator. Hey, I've done this before, I know what to do, I get this, I get that. And then uh, my memory is that I had to go up to get a cable or something, and I went up and I looked out the window, and it's like, wow! And you get that first view out the window of, of being uh, 250 miles above the Earth, um, and, and seeing the Earth sort of as you, we never we don't see it as a marble. We're not that far away, but we see it as a panorama. And if you've seen the IMAX movies of what it looks like from the shuttle or the space station, it fu- funnily enough, uh, my 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 thought was this is just like the IMAX movie. I mean, <laughs> have you ever been to if you if you ever been to uh, to uh, Epcot and Disney? You know they have. Epcot Center, and they have a little Paris, and they have a little Germany, and they have a little China, you know. And it was funny because I've been, you know, then I go to Paris, I go, this is just like Epcot. So, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's what I, that was, that was the, I looked out and I'm like, this is just like, this is just like the IMAX. This is, this is, and what I really meant was the first time you see that thing in IMAX where you, you, know, you have to turn your head to see everything, and it's the beautiful earth uh, rolling below you. And that, the first time you see it, that it's breathtaking. And my memory is, it was that breathtaking. I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And so I didn't get the, it wasn't like I want to go to the window to see it. I was doing my procedures. And as I was doing my procedure, uh, you know, we passed by the, I passed by the window and got a glimpse of, uh, of the earth. And, and that's a memorable, that's a memorable time. So uh, I saw this uh, wonderful poem, uh, or not poem, an essay you wrote uh, called This I Believe in February 2008. And then you said you, you believe in os- optimism. Is that something you brought up with you or something you discovered up there? So, yes. Let me give you some background. There is a, uh, uh, in America, there's a thing called National Public Radio. It's the public radio you know, BBC-ish kind of thing, sure. and um, there has been a, uh, and in one of the news shows, they do a five-minute segment every Friday, or they did for 
years called This I Believe, and they would find people that have a story of some sort. And they would feature the story about something, uh, it's a sort of statement, what they believe and why. And, and, um, and so I was a fan of that. And uh, during my stay on the st space station, my mother passed away. And so there was a lot of attention about uh, this is the first time that a crew member's been in space when a close family member has passed away and all that stuff. And uh, I contacted the radio people and I thought I would like to do, as a tribute, I'd like to do a, an essay about from space on this I believe because I really liked that format, I really liked that program and I'd like to do it about my mom or that, that's what I would do it about. And so I, I tried to put in my head what, you know, what did I take away from my mom? What, what is it, what did it, you know, what can I, how can I take what I've learned from my mom down to a five minute essay? So that's, that, that's sort of how that, that whole thing happened. And, uh, and yeah, my mom was always an, an optimist in a, in, a, in a really sometimes uh, naive way. And, uh, but I think that that has really formed the way I view the world. And I, uh, and so, for instance, you know, I believe that, uh, I like not locking my doors in my house. I like it because I like to believe that people are good. People are, you know, people are good. There are bad people out there, but, but the huge majority of people are good. And so, of course, we lock our doors most of the time, but, but, but a lot of the time, I like to think that nothing's going to happen because I'm optimistic about that. And I like to think that we tell our kids, it's not so much anymore, I don't know what it's like here in Ireland, but you used to tell your kids, don't talk to strangers. If you're lost, do not talk to a stranger. And we tell our kids, talk to anybody that will help you. Find anybody and ask them for help. Because I want to believe that whoever they pick is going to help and be good to them. And I don't want them, I, this is my, my wife and I, do not want this, just because they don't know them, put them in the bad pile. Sure. And, and so we are a real really against this, they call it stranger danger. We are really against stranger danger, and I think that, I think that, that uh, that's not good for society to make that assumption, that just because you don't know them, something bad might happen to you. Anyway, that sort of, I call, that's what I call optimism. Uh, that's, that's what I, that's how I, that's how I sort of exemplify what I think of what my mom what I got from my mom in terms of optimism. So, yeah, so it's an essay. It's called Why I Believe, or This I Believe. Uh, I Believe in Optimism. And uh, it was great because uh, it ran on the day I landed. So we, we recorded it, and, uh, and, and wor I worked with them, and, and I knew I was going to land on a Sunday, and it, they run it on a Sunday. And it was my mom's birthday, so it was multiply appropriate. Well, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you said that the space station is the embodiment of where you think we can go as a global society. Yeah. In the last 10 years, you know, global politics for a lot of us has felt like some countries that were traditionally part of a larger community are starting to retreat back into themselves and isolationism is happening more and more. Do you think space exploration is resilient to that kind of change? Um. Space exploration has the benefit of being really expensive, and so, uh, and so, if we want to go to Mars, I don't think any one country or any one company will be able to afford it. And so, I think by necessity, going to Mars is going to require virtually everybody to chip in. Right now, the International Space Station is awesome because it, it. Uh, it is a collaboration between 18 nations, um, but most of them are Western Europe, North America, Japan. Russia is sort of the outlier there in that 
uh, alliance, mm. but, but they're a full member, right? But we don't have China, we don't have India. Um, and, and so you're right, <laughs> there is, in the past 10 years, there's, there has been this division where China now has a honest to goodness, legitimate human spaceflight program. India might not be far behind. Um, there are other countries that are destined to be spacefaring nations that, that are not included in our little clique. Uh, but, but I do believe that if we're going to do something as grandiose as go to Mars, none, none of these entities are probably going to be able to do it alone just because of the massive expense. I say that in a good way. Now, these massive, these big collaborative agreements, even like Space Station, are fragile because one nation can't afford anything anymore, what do you do? Or they don't want to be a part of it anymore, or they're at, at odds with another nation, you know, so um, like any big group uh, assemblage, you know, you, you run into the dynamics that could, that could be disastrous. Um, but, um, but I, so I don't think the space industry is immune to that. I think that uh, for smaller missions, uh, like SpaceX is planning to go to the moon, or no, uh, Lockheed Martin is planning to go to the moon on their own, and so these smaller missions are, 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 are can be done standalone, but I think the huge missions uh, have to be done globally. I have to ask a quick question for my colleague Daniela here, who saw that you were involved in uh, Nemo 2, yeah. and she was like, I'm totally cool going up into space, that's fine underwater for a week like that, that, that creeped her the hell out. I mean, <laughs> w did you feel a difference in terms of the, the experience? Was, was one worse for you or better? I mean, so, well, let me just explain. So we, we NASA, uh, the uh, ISS program, use an underwater laboratory in Florida to uh, help, uh, I say train, but simulate a space flight because uh, it's, it's a laboratory that from, by the National Ocean Oceanographic Association, and uh, it's used for some underwater research, but but we use it uh, a couple times a year. What we do is we take a crew of four to six people, and we uh, we go and we live underwater for for a week or so, week two weeks. And you have to live down there. You have to stay down when you're in there. You have to stay down there because it's so deep, the pressure is so high that coming up to the surface uh, would be harmful to you immediately. You have to do it very, in a very uh, deliberate, slow way. And so once you're down there, you're stuck. You can't go to the surface. And so in, in that sense, it's like space, right? You've got a spaceship. You can't just go home. And so, uh, so it's an analogy, and it's an analogy we use to test teamwork. We test procedures. We test a lot of things. It's, it's, it's interesting. Now, is it, uh, is it hard? Uh, your question is, is it better? What, what, was it harder? Was it like I scuba dive and I enjoy scuba diving, but um, to go to this thing, we you have to train for a week over a week, and you're doing eight hours of scuba diving uh, because you got to be really really good scuba to go down there. And then when you're down there, what do we do? We scuba dive because you're down there. You might as well do so. You put on the wetsuit and you go out for a three hour dive. You come in for lunch. You take off your you peel off your wetsuit. You have lunch. You put that damp wetsuit back on, and you go back out for three hours or four hours in the afternoon. And we do testing and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, so it's worse than the ISS in that it's really uncomfortable. I mean, it's really physically uncomfortable. You're wet all the time, and then even in the in the laboratory, it's 100% humidity. So it's just because it's you're underwater. So. Uh, so first of all, I have now had a lifetime worth of scuba diving. I don't think I don't. I'm, I'm happy if I. I'm okay if I never scuba dive again. Um, uh, it, it has it, it, it. Its unique environment is just more uncomfortable. But you see, it is fantastic. You have sea life that's coming right up to you, and I mean, I'm glad that I was given that opportunity to do so. But but in terms of the claustrophobia, maybe or the. Uh, I don't know. It, none of that. It felt. It felt like being in space. You know, you're isolated, and that's the whole point. That's why we use it. So I'm glad I did it, but uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not eager to go do something like that again. Okay. So my absolute favorite 
question to ask anybody with any kind of expertise is how that expertise has ruined pop culture on them. So I don't know if you guys have ever watched Jurassic Park with a paleontologist. They will spend the entire movie yelling at the screen. The velociraptors aren't that tall. They're supposed to have feathers. If I'm watching Live and Let Die, the Roger Moore movie, I have a herpetologist by training. Every single snake in that movie is harmless, but he whips out like a flamethrower to kill one of them. So I seem to be the only person in the theater who can appreciate that. Does the same thing happen for you ever? Are you ever watching a space movie going, that's, that's not how that happens? Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, you have to, right? And so uh, uh, what, what's most, I'm more amazed when they get it right. So, uh, so like for the 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 spectrum is like uh, what's it, gravity. Um, well, the far spectrum is something like uh, what was the one with uh, Aerosmith and uh, oh Armageddon. Armageddon, yeah. right, right. So that's that's way out there. Uh, gravity was uh, gravity was laughable in a lot of ways from a physics point of view. But you know, it was the graphics were great. And then you go out. The other end is uh, Apollo 13. I would say, and Apollo 13 was unbelievably accurate in some of the most minute details. Um, like, like people would not know this, but, but, the there's a scene where Swiker gets the call because he's the backup astronaut, and he gets the call to, to replace the guy that might have been exposed to measles, and he's at the Cape, and he's and he he. Phone's ringing and he goes, oh, you know, that's the backup astronaut's job. I got to go something with the guest list. That's exactly right. That's exactly that. That was exactly on the nose. Like as a backup astronaut, he's down there. He's got a job, and most of the time, it's going to be to arrange the guest list to do some sort of crappy job. But somebody's got to do it. And I remember, I remember seeing it first. And then being an astronaut, and then seeing it again, and thought, "Wow, that was really perceptive." The role of the backup astronaut is to, you know, help drive somebody somewhere or do something. Um, and almost all the technical stuff in Apollo 13 was good, but there are a few little things that, that are different, and that's where he, that's where he, I, you know, I think, "Oh, how could they get that wrong?" Yeah. And uh, but but uh, but the spacesuits are so accurate. And the panels are so accurate, and uh, the physics is so accurate. So no, it, so question is, it doesn't ruin it for me. I'm a lot. I let. I I'm happy to let that stuff go over. But I but I can't help but notice that switch is in the wrong position, right? <laughs> or that's not the way they do that. So. So uh, I'm just gonna ask one or two questions from the floor um, before we wrap up. But I just like to point out, John here actually saw you taken off. Uh, which so which flight? Uh, 120. 120. Yeah. Excellent. Um, didn't know there was a connection before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I have a question. Yeah. About, um, I spent months training every day, while in space. Uh-huh. How do you react to the instructions to repair further repairs? All right. So uh, let me set this. So uh, on my shuttle flight that John saw the launch, when we had many t tasks. We were supposed to have five spacewalks, and uh, the solar rays are like big Japanese fans. They fold back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and brrrr, or Venetian blinds, sort of. And uh, But they're very fragile, and they're very delicate. And uh, you send the command to close them, and they, they, there's a motor that pulls them together, and then you send a command to expand them, and they, they, a motor pulls them apart. And uh, we, uh, part of our mission, we were supposed to expand, expand the solar rays. So they, they're expanding, and then uh, it, it's, you don't push the button and then come back in 20 minutes. You push the button, and eight people sit and watch different aspects of how it's working because it's so fragile. Well, it turns out that uh, the sun was coming through our field of view, and we, we don't look out the window from the space station. We do everything through cameras, and so. Uh, uh, I was the I was counting number of bays. It's called. So I was, I had one job. My job was to count, and and the sun came through the view and flared the cameras for five seconds. And after the flare came out, 
the soul red ripped. Stop, right? Okay. Something really bad had happened, something that we hadn't planned for. And, uh, and so uh, we did not have space walkers out at that time. So at that moment, we knew the whole flight had changed because we got to fix the solar array. We didn't know how it was going to happen. Plus, um, turns out that the solar array in that configuration was not certified for shuttle undocking. So now we didn't even know, can we undock the shuttle? Can the shuttle guys go home? We didn't even know if that was possible. Lots of unknowns. So the question is, we train for everything. If there's going to be something we, if there's something we're going to do, we train for it 25 times, and and uh, half those times they break something on us just so we can figure out how to do it right. And so we train for every possible thing that we think we're going to do. Well, this was something that nobody had ever thought about before. How are you going to go fix a solar array? And uh, and so. We had the easy job, frankly, because we don't have the smarts to figure out how to fix it. Okay, all those smarts are on the ground, and so we knew from that moment that. Uh, and so what happened is four days from then, all this, everything else got canceled, and uh, four days, three days later, they planned a spacewalk where we're going to go out and we're going to fix the solar array, something we've never ever done or trained before, and uh, we knew that on the ground there are going to people pull the people that. We're not going to get any sleep for the next three days. They, they had to, they had to develop the procedures. They had to practice it, get in the swimming pool, and practice it as a spacewalk. Huge amount of work. By the time it comes up to us, it's a procedure that is pretty well scrubbed, pretty well practiced, pretty well um, thought through. Um, but it was exciting for us because. As John points out, if we're going to do a spacewalk, we practice that spacewalk 10 times. I mean, from start to finish, we, we know exactly what the next move is and where your partner is. Here, we're going to go out and do a spacewalk we've never even seen before. The night before, we were reading the procedure, and, and now we're going to go out and do it. I was the robot arm operator. I, I ro operated the robot arm, and we put a guy at the end of this arm and reached him as far as we can. We've never done that with the arm. and so. As the arm operator, I get to read through the procedure for the first time as I'm doing it. And it, it was thrilling from the point of view, like, we we were, we were so hanging our asses out here. It is so, this is, we were in territory that, you know, we, you know, we've never been asked to do something so wild with no practice. And so for us, it was exhilarating because it was sort of exciting to be doing such a wild thing. And uh, it, it is one of the big successes of the International Space Station, getting that thing fixed. And, uh, um, but so for us, we knew that the ground was killing themselves to get the products ready to send up to us, the procedures and everything. And uh, it was our job to just execute it so that, um, so that we get, it, get the job done. That's a great question. So uh, I know Tara has a question from many, our many internet fan groups. Ah. Uh, this, this is from Manfred in Germany. Ah. Does EVA get routine at some point with all my EVA experience? Uh, does it get routine? No, I mean, what gets routine is the procedure. So you get putting on the suit's complicated. And so you put on the suit, but then, and it's, you know, 25 pages of procedures to put on the suit. What gets routine is you get used to that. You get used to, okay, now, oh, this is the place where I have to wait for 20 minutes and uh, breathe oxygen or something like that. And so the procedures get routine. Um, I would say that there's a danger that I probably fell into, which is the fifth time out the door, you think you know what's gonna happen and you then you catch yourself and you realize, this is pretty serious. I'm, I have you know, three eighths of an inch of plexiglass between me and the vacuum of space. And if the glove would happen to pop off, or if uh, if I crack, you know, if I should get a crack in the next seal, you know, that's potentially deadly. And so, uh, like many things, even here on Earth, uh, we do dangerous things, but we start 
thinking that nothing is going to go wrong because nothing has, has ever gone wrong. And we, 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 the astronauts, try to remind each other all the time that it's not less likely that something's going to go wrong just because it hasn't. And we, we have to remember how dangerous and critical it is. So, yes, there are times when, you, when we fall into this trap where it gets routine, but uh, we remind each other quite often that, uh, hey, let's, let's stay sharp. Let's make sure that we don't, uh, let's not take any shortcuts. But I contend that driving a car on a highway exposes yourself to the same kinds of uh, imminent dangers. And so I take that experience from uh, space and I try to remember the same thing in the car, going down the highway, going 70 miles an hour, that I can't think that nothing's going to happen because nothing ever has happened and I should be uh, thinking that something can happen. That's a good, that's a good mindset to have in your head, uh, even driving down the highway. So to wrap up, uh, last question, two-parter. Absolute worst thing about the job and the absolute best thing about the job. That's a great question. The worst thing about being an astronaut. Well, let me do the best thing because um, there are a couple best things. Absolute best thing about being an astronaut, high school reunions. <laughs> so, so uh, now honestly, I've never been. I haven't been back to my high school reunion yet. So, uh, the other, the other best thing about uh, astronaut is the business card. I love my business card. Uh, Daniel Tani, astronaut. That's great. So, uh, but uh, so, but in, in, I guess in, in, in more to the point of your question. Um, you know, yeah, we get to find space. That you, you can't beat that. Uh, but we get to represent something that is almost, uh, almost, almost universally viewed as good, doing good, and and very few. I don't. Maybe there's some people out there, but very few people think being an astronaut is a bad thing, or space travel is a bad thing, and that that we're that we're harming the environment or people or whatever, and and that can be against, There are very few people against astronauts. So we have the privilege of representing something that is good, and I like that, that's a privilege of mine. Worst thing about being an astronaut, it was, I mean, you know, you're a government employee, so you have to suffer through the uh, restrictions of being a government employee like, like any other government employee, and so what does that mean? I can't, that means when I, when I used to be an astronaut, uh, I couldn't, uh, I, I, like any government employee, couldn't accept anything of value of more than $25, so if somebody wanted to take me for a ride of golf or buy me a dinner, I, I couldn't accept that. Um, uh, but that's so minor. <laughs> you know, that, that, really, that, really is, that really is so minor. There, um, I'll have to think about that. There were not many, there, there were not many downsides uh, uh, for being an astronaut, except that maybe, maybe the stress that your family goes through when you, when, you, when you get the highlight of your career is the most stressful time in your family's life. And that's tough, you know, that's hard. So, but again, that's true of jet fighters and, you know, coal miners and, you know, so that it's, I don't, I don't want to consider ourselves any more special than any other firefighters or uh, policemen. So, um, I don't know, that's a good question. I'll have to think about that. That's a good, that's a good question to have an answer to. So, so uh, thank you all for coming to join us uh, on this night on the middle of Space Week 2018. Uh, I've been Rob, I'm from Black Rock Castle Observatory, and uh, Dan is our patron. And I want to give a huge round of applause to Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob.